Jen Drando, the Public Works Committee. He not only chaired that committee, as Nick Rayo will tell you, he owned it. He owned it. And I was one of his boys. I learned a lot from Jenny Drando, although I never called him Jenny, he was also always Mr. Chairman. He taught me that you're there to serve and produce for your people. And my Lord, did he produce for West Virginia. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Joe Geiger. I'm the director of West Virginia Archives and History, and I'd like to welcome you to the opening of the Senator Jennings Randolph Collection. I wish to express my appreciation to our distinguished speakers for their participation in today's event, and I especially wish to acknowledge the presence of our special guests, Mr. Frank Randolph, the son of Jennings Randolph, who resides in Washington, and Mr. Brian Randolph, the grandson of Senator Randolph, who came all the way from St. Louis. Gentlemen, welcome back to West Virginia. Jennings Randolph served in the House of Representatives from 1933 to 1947 and in the U.S. Senate from 1958 to 1985. His work as a representative of the people had a positive effect on nearly all Americans, and his quest for peace and work on other global issues made the world in which we live today a better place. His senatorial collection, which numbers more than 900 boxes, was initially housed at Salem University and was transferred to the State Archives in 2005. Bless you. Then Archives Director Fred Armstrong, Deborah Basham, and I spent some long, hot days reboxing the collection, which later made its way to the Culture Center. Over the next decade, we processed the photographs, constituent correspondence files, speeches and press releases, but half of the collection remained unprocessed. Last summer, we were fortunate to have Aaron Parsons join us as a WVU graduate fellow, and his enthusiasm and tremendous work ethic enabled us to move forward rapidly. With the help of several additional staff members, we were able to finish the project by the end of 2017. This was a momentous accomplishment, and we are quite proud of the results. I want to thank all archives and, and history staff members uh, that worked on this project, particularly those in attendance today. And in addition to Aaron, Dick Faust worked on the audiovisual materials, Deborah Basham worked on the legislation, and Mary Johnson worked on our photograph collection. We also want to make you aware of some other work that we have done in preparation for this event. A new exhibit on Senator Randolph is on display in the Archives Photo Gallery, which will be seen by every individual exiting the museum for the next few months. These three cases on this side of the room contain documents, photographs, and other materials that offer us a glimpse at the Senator's career, and we encourage you to view these items. Finally, staff put together an online exhibit entitled Senator Jennings Randolph, your new dealer for all the years that reviews his life and work. As primary source materials from the collection are digitized, they will be added to the exhibit. I wish to acknowledge the work of Aaron on these endeavors, along with Chuck Ockeltree, Mary Johnson, and Lloyd Tomlinson, who is serving his WVU fellowship with us this summer. Our intent when we began planning this June 20th event was to discuss the contents of the collection, to review the finding aid, and to highlight the new exhibits. As our speakers list grew longer, however, we quickly realized that the best thing that we could do was to let our invited guests tell us their stories about this wonderful West Virginian whose collection we dedicate here today. Our primary mission at Archives and History is to collect and preserve the history of West Virginia. These rich resources matter little, however, if the public is unaware of their existence. The internet has enabled researchers around the world to find materials preserved in the state archives through our detailed finding aids, such as the one created for the Randolph Collection. The internet has also permitted archives and history the opportunity to share primary source materials online to participate in the educational process so essential in the development of tomorrow's leaders. One of the challenges we face, however, is the expectation that every answer can be found online, 
and that everything that we find online is accurate. This is a dangerous mentality, and it is essential that we encourage young people to dig deeper, to waste sources, and to not simply accept everything we read as truth without verification through research. This 734-page document is the finding aid for the Randolph Collection, and the detail that it contains greatly enhances the probability that researchers around the world will find relevant materials preserved in this tremendously valuable collection, which documents in detail the positive impact of Senator Jennings Randolph on our state, our country, and our world. Now let's get started. Our first speaker is the director of the Benedum Library at Salem University, Dr. Phyllis Friedman. Dr. Friedman? Thank you for the opportunity to come and speak to this particularly momentous occasion. We, of course, have followed this over time. And every story has a beginning. We're going to talk a little bit about the beginning for Jennings Randolph. Jennings Randolph was born in Salem, West Virginia. He went to school there throughout his, his primary and secondary years, and then he went to Salem College, where he became a beginner in some of the areas that the rest of his life involved. He was what we would call today, or we did in my day, a big man on campus. He belonged to many different organizations. But there are two in particular that I would like to point out that he was involved in. One was the beginning of the Salem College newspaper called The Green and White, which up until several years ago was published regularly by the university or the college as it was then. And that was a good way to get him started on his journalism career. The second was something that happened in his senior year. He was selected as a member of the Board of Directors of Salem College. I believe from everything I've been able to find out that that was the first time that a college student was selected for this kind of position. And of course that set him out. Well, he probably had already had a taste of politics, but that certainly was a good grounding because boards of directors are political. We cannot uh, ignore that fact. The senator kept up with Salem College through the years because he stayed on the board of directors until the late 80s, I believe, probably until the time that the Japanese group took over the university. During that time, he was very helpful to the university, particularly in bringing to campus some very important people. We had, for example, as speakers, such people as Nelson Rockefeller, uh, Sonny Liston, uh, Napoleon Hill, who wrote a book that then included some information about the senator. I believe that that was something that people today look at and get some idea of how to think and how to move ahead. And we today in Salem still have opportunities to interact with Senator Jennings Randolph as we go to the Randolph Campus Center and have lunch. That's always a, a happy time, but it's also the administrative building for the university. In that building, there is a room called the Mary Bab Lounge where we sometimes have meetings honoring the senator's wife. And on the campus of the university is the house that Senator Randolph's family lived in, in during his growing years. So we in Salem still remember Senator Randolph. We still value the fact that he worked with us for so many years. And we are very happy to be part of this particular honoring occasion. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Friedman. We are very grateful for our next speaker for to our next speaker for coming in from Washington for this special event, the director of the Jennings Randolph Recognition Project, Mr. Nicholas Hollis. Thank you, Joe. Th ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to be with you uh, and to thank you, Joe, for this opportunity. It's one of the pleasures of my life to be here tonight, this afternoon. I'm skipping ahead of myself, but uh, the fact that, that um, people from outside are often looked upon with some askance here in West Virginia, I, I want to state upfront and personal that I'm from the mountains too. I'm from the Green Mountains up in the northern part of our country called Vermont. And uh, I came from a little town up there called Randolph. Strange coincidences. But um, I must say that these strange coincidences wove themselves together into what became one of the great, if not most important, professional collaboration of my life. And uh, I can say that having been in Washington numerous years and having worked with a lot of different luminaries that the fact that um, this will be discussed a bit later in the presentation, but the fact that these coincidences led to this walking antique now. I'm 74 years of Randolph standing before you, uh, if you count my time growing up in Randolph, Vermont. Uh, but what we're really talking about, looking back at these kinds of years and efforts, is, is a long living memory. And my role today, according to my boss here, Joe, is to tell you a little bit about Randolph's international ex experience. And uh, to do that, I have to um, weave myself back into this to say that I got interested in uh, an idea back in the 70s working for the Carter administration as an appointee having to do with triangulation in the international arena of monies, uh, technology, and land in Africa to develop food. And the idea was to work with the uh, Arab countries that had oil revenues uh, in excess of what they needed and uh, bring it together with uh, the African land and the need and U.S. technology. The State Department actually paid me to go around the world and talk about this in various countries. I came up with the idea, uh, but ideas, as you know, are not very, uh, without traction, they're not really very, uh, very potent. Um, but uh, I'm skipping again ahead of myself. Um, I want to say something before I go past this point about Randolph. Um, Jennings Randolph was one of those people that you never forget. I want to tell you the first meeting I had with him in 1978, I was struck with the buoyant effervescence. It reminded me a little bit of what Winston Churchill said about FDR meeting him. That meeting Jennings Randolph was like uncorking your first bottle of champagne. I mean, he was sparkling. He was positive. He had a voice that was melodic, mesmerizing even, well cadenced. He believed in oratory and he was actually ended up as a teacher of oratory. But he was also very effective in written communication and he became in this course of development a journalist first with the Clarksburg Exponent and then he became an editor. Um, but he, and this was in, in his Elkins years, uh, putting out the, the uh, New West Virginia Review. He had the ability to mesmerize with his voice and also with his presence. Um, he had a handshake, which I can't ever forget when I first met him, was a huge hands. He had wonderfully warm, strong hands, a handshake. And he was, he was bear-like, really, but reassuring. And he drew you in with that handshake and with that engaging eye contact and with the warm smile. He radiated warmth. And that networking ability that he developed later in his life, astounding before internet, had a lot to do with what that radiance and personality was all about. And people gravitated to him. They gravitated, to, it was an orbit that he had. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of fell into that in a certain way in the Carter years. But again, we'll, that will end up being discussed by another speaker. Um, I want to make a couple of comments about his character, which was very important, because he learned, I think, lessons of life early and applied those lessons and applied his interests persistently over his life. He's picked out a few key topics, of key things that he believed in, some of which were come from a long heritage of 
of uh, very prominent individuals. But um, those pickings of themes, as his his friends of truth belief that he was um, talking about always as friends, um, he talked and, and worked toward the idea of mobility, and aviation was key to that. He it was infrastructure oriented. He liked the idea of building airstrips on mountaintops. He liked the idea of getting in and out of the mountains, uh, taking his spirit out into the world. Um, ran for Congress and lost at first, but then ran again in 32 and won with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, he was a positive, creative person who never let odds get him down. He never let negatives get him down. He always fought for the rural poor, for the guy by the wayside of the road. And he believed in the power of food and energy. Um, he, of course, believed in disabilities. I think others are going to talk about different topics that he picked in his life to focus on. But one thing that people don't focus on often is how focused he was on heritage. He was very interested in uh, heritage. And he bookended his life, really, the whole 20th century, from t 1902 to 1996. He was uh, namesaked after William Jennings Bryan. Uh, and that's a very important point because I know that he studied William Jennings Bryan's life, campaigns, and what Bryan believed in himself, and patterned his own life choices after Bryan. Uh, the story goes that Bryan was actually in Salem when uh, Jennings Randolph was born, and Randolph had, he hadn't been named by his father, and Bryan said, why don't you name him after me? He'd be, he'd be a good Democrat. And uh, the, um, the name stuck. And um, Jennings Randolph commented, talked about, and used a lot of Bryan's populism and the concept of the forgotten people. He was not uh, a guy who ever dis fo focused a dislike in any kind of harsh terms on anything. But he was, by the very stance in life that he took, uh, the, the, the opponent of, of, of greed, the opponent of, of uh, political corruption, the opponent of, of a lot of things that just by standing firm for the people, he would always talk about the people. Um, ended up uh, getting him into, you know, some of those kinds of uh, long-term uh, struggles that we endure in Washington. But he had values, unlike a lot of people these days. And he consulted with his ancestors. And uh, it reminds me of what, you know, when we're looking here at the collection that Joe has so brilliantly put together, and is allowing now people to see. It's like the, the needle in the haystack can be found. But in that context, you know, when you, when you find, when you behold through your research an ancestor, it's a glorious thing. It's a wonderful thing. And you can only do that with research. And you can only do that with the true uh, uh, resources that this library represents. Randolph was a teacher. He was a, he was a mentor. He, he liked working with youth. He, he was a coach. He was a basketball coach and he was a, a speech coach. Pardon me for one second. Getting a little dry here. Um, as a coach, um, he coached me. I learned from him at his knee, really. He was a generous man, a, the generosity of spirit that's just un, it's not very often found anywhere. And uh, although I worked with a lot of... Uh, fairly prominent individuals in Washington before and after Jennings Randolph. There was nobody, and I mean nobody, that came close to rivaling him on the human traits and the, um, the amazing, I mean, the amazing character that he presented. Um, in, the, in the formulation of our collaboration, which takes us to the international stage, Jennings Randolph pulled together a lot of these qualities I've been talking about in the last few minutes and he coalesced those qualities. Not only did he become a famous uh, effective legislator in Washington as, as in years of Congress. He was served in Congress from 1933 to 1946. He got beat in the Truman uh, sort of landslide, opposite landslide problem in 1946. Um, and events, his events uh, in the international stage coalesced slowly through his own interest in international and taking these qualities I've talked about. He knew Brian, for example, had traveled the world on numerous occasions. He knew Brian had visited people like Tolstoy. He knew 
that uh, uh, the international arena was no bigger challenge than Washington. It's just a question of gathering those same skills. And he could already tell he had people in his uh, gravitational sphere. So when he appeared uh, to be interested one day in the uh, Agri-Energy Roundtable, this concept I alluded to earlier when I was in the State Department, uh, I didn't take him seriously at first because he was a busy, busy senator. But what he said was, Nick, can I help you in any way with this? Um, and at that point in time, we were trying to get uh, support for an idea that we wanted to incorporate into, an, into a nonprofit organization. And he helped immensely in that, helped with the conferencing that we approached as a strategy to get more people aware of the idea and also to get people um, to literally walk with their feet to find out about this food and energy exchange we were talking about. How do we get the countries with the food together with the countries with the energy sit down and have a, have a, a dialogue after a world of, of a decade of terrible inflation and uh, uh, world turmoil, really. Carter called it the moral imperative to war. But the, the fact of the matter is that, that uh, Randolph, when he appeared at the first agri-energy roundtable overseas, there, there had been some roundtables in the US that he also showed interest in. But he encouraged his, uh, one of his old friends, Armin Hammer, to become interested. And Armin Hammer, as you may or may not know, it's a long time ago, and I'm, I'm before you a walking antique, and I realize that a lot of people can't, shouldn't be able to connect with something that happened back in the 70s. But Armin Hammer was the big oil magnate with an international heart who was traveling the world and had worked for you know, many, many years at that point. These men were both in their 80s. I want to point out that Randolph, when he came to the international program, used all those same skills, and he brought into focus with Saudi princes and uh, Nigerian chiefs and members of the House of Lords, Frank Smiling, he knows this, to be true that, that not only did he bring them to the conference, he, he smoothed them in ways from various platforms that the program allowed. He had many hats that he used to wear at this international program. He was the speaker organizing spirit of the speaker sponsored dinner that we you know, brought all the speakers together at first night. He was the opening speaker, usually the first day of the conference. He chaired the board meeting. He helped me, you know, did the head table award ceremonies. He, was ab he did so many different things in the conference that re were required to make the thing work that um, you'd have to be, you'd marvel at his, at his skills. I have this picture on the uh, screen because I want to share with you what this picture to me symbolizes. And pictures, of course, tell a thousand stories in a thousand words, but only if you know what happened here. The littler man shaking Jennings Randolph's hand is Al Sidiri, Prince Al Sidiri of Saudi Arabia, who was at the time the president of the International Fund for Agriculture Development, IFAD, in Rome. And Randolph had met with Al Sidiri in Geneva that same year earlier. And Al Sidiri had come up to his suite and pleaded with him. And uh, the problem was that Ronald Reagan, this president, wanted to chop this UN agency off at the knees. What did, I, what did the International EFAD Fund represent? It represents, and still does today, the rural poor, people in countries that don't have uh, food resources. And it's kind of like a big fund bank operation. And Sidiri was here pleading, not with Randolph, he was thanking Randolph. Why? Because Reagan had taken EFAD off the chopping block, much to David Stockman's surprise, and Sidiri was thanking him here. Because Sidiri and the EFAD were UN related as agencies of the UN system, the UN, as a result of this intervention, gave us, as a nonprofit organization, UN accreditation. And that made a huge difference in the appeal of the program over the years. Now, I just want to say a couple last things before closing. One is that he was truly a man of the world, and I truly miss him, and I think that as a, as a man of the world, um, I reminded of what Chief Asima, one of our directors, said at the Capitol Memorial Service about Randolph. He said, life is your mirror. Whatever you do, it will do. However you are, it will be. Keep it shining. And uh, this was out of, out of Africa. Uh, one of the directors had been with Agri Energy for many years, loved Jennings Randolph. Randolph called him roly-poly. I think there's a picture of him here somewhere, but um, 
he, he affected people, and we knew this when he died because letters came in from all over the world. There's Roly Poly saying, thing. Um, but this man was a significant power in West, in West Africa. Um, and he kept coming over and over to these conferences. And um, I also want to say one last thing about this, this um, program because I, I can't stress enough how important it is what Joe Geiger has done here. Because the, the power that these photographs bring together and with proper you know, captioning and, and research can produce enormously interesting stories, at least to the historian and probably to people that are interested in tracking some of Jennings Randolph's favorite issues. But uh, for Joe Geiger and uh, Joe Phillips, she's here, and, and uh, others that have conceived and worked, and uh, this is tedious work, folks. It's tough stuff, saving and preserving papers. Uh, and getting them organized in a way that somebody can come in and have a, have a fighting chance to get to what they're interested in. But uh, he always used to say, and I think this, this program could even be uh, with some opportunity here, through the, our project is designed to keep Jennings Randolph's spirit alive. It's designed to keep promoting his ideas. It's designed to bring him into focus too. Keep the, spot out, the spotlight on people like Jennings Randolph, not on other um, actors that may not be worthy of it. And uh, to rekindle some of the idealism through um, research and to advance voters and to uh, remember those quiet acts of kindness that typified him in his life. Um, I just want to say thank you again for the, for the opportunity to stand here. It's one of the pleasures of my life. Right. Hmm. We have a letter here from. Let me get it open. Um, Senator Steve Sims, retired of Idaho. Thank you for the kind invitation to join you at the public opening of the Senator Jennings Randolph Collection on June twentieth, twenty eighteen. Unfortunately, scheduling of, and time constraints prevent me from attending this auspicious occasion. It was my distinct honor to serve with Senator Randolph during the last four years of his tenure on the United States Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works. He was a true patriot, and I have many fond mem memories of him. As a new senator, I was immediately thrust into the fray as chairman of the Highway Committee. Senator Randolph graciously chair shared his, in his extensive knowledge and expertise on the many issues before, before the committee. His help to me in the passage of the highway programs was invaluable. Although I am unable to join you for this event, I look forward to viewing the online exhibit. In these modern times, perhaps this exhibit will serve to bring Senator Randolph's legacy, his contributions to democracy, and his many achievements to a wider audience and new generations to come. My very best wishes on your success. Sincerely, Steve Sims. United States Senator retired. Thank you, Lloyd. <clears throat> Our next speaker is the current Speaker of the House of Delegates, of West Virginia, Tim Armstead. Tim, thank you. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, it's um, it is certainly an honor to be here on West Virginia Day to be able to participate in the opening of this exhibit. I'm very excited to be able to see this exhibit and uh, have a, a story that relates to it that uh, where I have a, a very kind of an odd connection with this exhibit. But uh, the, um, when I was 17 years old, I got the opportunity to participate in a program called Presidential Classroom for Young Americans. It's a program that still sends young students to Washington, D.C. each year from West Virginia to be able to go and participate in discussions about uh, the, our, our federal government and to be able to meet their United States senators and, and members of Congress. And so I was very excited. I was 17 years old. Uh, it was about a month before my 18th birthday, which kind of enters into this as well. Uh, the, uh, 
The opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. and to meet uh, then Congressman Bob Wise had just been a congressman for about a month. He was in a temporary office and we got to, I got to meet him and talk with him. Uh, and, uh, and then wasn't able to, to meet with Senator Byrd, but got the opportunity to meet with Senator Randolph. And so I showed up there uh, this mor that morning. There was a large breakfast going on that day with Ronald Reagan had a congressional breakfast the day. It was February 3rd, 1983. And President Reagan was meeting with Congress. He was having a breakfast with Congress. And so I showed up in, uh, very early in Senator Randolph's office, and he, uh, he wasn't there at the moment. And there was some confusion about the, the appointment that I had. And, and so I thought, well, I'm probably not going to get to see Senator Randolph. It's, uh, it's a conflict of time. And, and I don't know whether he was at that breakfast, or uh, I think perhaps he was. Um, and they said, well, how long can you stay? And, and I said, you know, I've got pretty limited that morning, uh, pretty, pretty much open that morning. And so I said, well, please wait. We will get him. If he had an appointment with you, we want to, you to, to, to be able to meet him. So I, I had this opportunity, and it was a tremendous opportunity. Now, I'm sure Senator Randolph, in the, in the 50 years that he was, uh, you know, uh, in, in government and in Congress and in the Senate, uh, met tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of students, and I'm sure you know, those didn't necessarily make an impression on him, but it certainly made an impression on each of those students, including myself. And uh, it was a tremendous opportunity because even though I as a, would, would a month later, thanks to the senator, allow you know, his work on the 26th Amendment, a month later I would register as a Republican. And, uh, you know, we had a great conversation. He was very friendly, very nice to me, and, I, and he asked me what my views were. And we had a great discussion. And, uh, and, you know, he was not at all, you know, didn't treat me, I'm sure, any differently because he knew I was very much on the other side of the political spectrum than he was. It was a tremendous conversation. And his office at the time in Washington was basically a museum. Uh, I don't know how many of you were there, but those, I'm sure, who worked with him, but others who got the opportunity. And he took probably an hour and a half and took me throughout his office and showed me pictures on the wall and told me stories about uh, what that picture meant, particularly the 26th Amendment. He had some documents on his wall related to that, a pen uh, that related to the 26th Amendment and talked about uh, his, his work on the 26th Amendment to allow me, who then three weeks later would have that opportunity to register three years earlier than I would have otherwise had the opportunity. And, you know, one of my political heroes, Ronald Reagan, I got to vote for him in 1984, uh, which I wouldn't have otherwise had that opportunity to ever have voted for him had I had to wait till I was 21. So it was very significant to me. But in, in the course of talking with Senator Randolph, uh, he talked about, and I noticed one of the pictures in the exhibit is a picture of him at a picnic with Franklin Roosevelt. And he had a large picture of that in his office. And he had copies of that picture. And that where he had, I guess, Franklin Roosevelt had signed it or he had signed it. And then he himself took those copies and personally signed them and gave me a copy of that picture, as well as a book that I have with me here today that uh, I've kept for the last 35 years. It says, best wishes to Tim Armstead from his friend Senator James Randolph. Now, um, we sat in that office that day, and he, and he signed this and gave it to me. And um, also, I had just happened to have my camera, so I took a picture of him that I still have actually signing this book for me, <laughs> sitting at his desk. So I still have that. Uh, but it was a great, really a tremendous opportunity for a young 17-year-old kid from West Virginia to be able to sit with his United States senator and have that conversation, and it's meant a lot to me. Uh, like I said, we were on different political spectrums, had different political views, but he was so uh, tremendously open to me and gave me that opportunity to ask him questions about things, and he talked about his work as a congressman when Franklin Roosevelt was president. He talked about uh, the work on the 26th Amendment, different things that were going on at the time in the early 1980s. Uh, and of course, you know, he would then retire a year after this. So I was fortunate to have that opportunity to meet with him. But I, I also, the last story I'll tell is that um, we, uh, we got into discussion about, you know, I wasn't able to vote yet, but I was just talking about that I like Gerald Ford. And when I came back home from, um, from this trip, uh, about a month later, I got in the mail a picture autographed by Gerald Ford that he had taken the, the time to, you know, from, from me talking about that, he had gotten 
he knew Gerald Ford, had served with him, and had written him and asked him to send me a picture that I still have autographed to Gerald Ford. Now, unfortunately, one thing that, uh, that and this is why the collection is very important to me as well. Uh, one thing is, um, you know, I had, he had sent me a picture autographed of the, uh, the time when, of, of me and him during this meeting, and I had that for several years. And unfortunately, as far as I know, I have not been able to find it since then. Uh, I believe that in the flood in, in 2016, I lost that picture. Um, the picture of, of me and him in that, in, in that day that he had signed. What is really um, unique is, I didn't think that those pictures would necessarily be still in this collection. But I, I contacted Deborah and I asked her, I said, well, just wonder, you know, if I thought maybe you have. And they were in that picture, that collection. Not only that picture, but a couple more that he, I didn't, you know, I guess they took two or three. And they had two or three of those. And so I'm a little embarrassed at what my hair looks like in that picture. I, <laughs> 1980s, I kind of have long hair. I kind of wish it was the same color it was in, but I don't, you know, I definitely needed a haircut that day. But um, uh, that was sort of the 80s. But the, uh, the uh, opportunity to get that picture back meant a lot to me. And so I've gotten a copy of that picture. Uh, with Senator Randolph giving me a calendar, one of the congressional calendars, and giving me this book. Uh, so uh, even though I, I believe I've lost that picture that he gave me, I, it was fortunate that I was able to get back a copy. And that's why I think this, this collection is so important. For so many of those things that people may have had over his 50, year, 50 years in Congress uh, that they may not have now copies of, that now this collection will let them be able to go back and research his history and his service to our state. And so uh, I'm one of the, the people that while very, it's the only time I ever met him was that one time. It was the only time that I ever met Senator Randolph. But it meant a great deal to me and I, I had great memories of that opportunity. And I think that's the kind of person he was, that he would take the time as a senator who had served so many years our state to take an hour and a half with a 17-year-old kid from West Virginia and talk to him about um, his experience in Congress is, says a great deal about his character and who he was. And so I appreciate that opportunity and thank you for, for letting me share with you today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our next speaker is the Honorable Chief Justice of the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals, Margaret Workman. It's a tremendous honor to be able to participate today. Um, Senator Randolph was, um, his accomplishments were legendary. And to echo what the director of the Randolph Recognition Project said, he was effervescent, he was full of life. And like Tim Armistead, um, Speaker of the House, I still have Randolph memorabilia too. As a a kid growing up in the 60s, of course, my family was a working poor family, not involved in politics in any way. But in that era, young people got involved in issues, and so I found myself getting involved in issues and becoming active in the Democratic Party. And my first encounter, as, as well as my various encounters with Senator Randolph for the rest of the time that I did encounter him, were all so positive. I can remember at a Jefferson Jackson Day dinner, the big Democratic fundraiser dinner every year, that he was pictured, he was honored on the cover, and after the dinner was over, I think I was still in high school then, I gathered up all the extra programs and sent them to him. And of course, he sent a personal handwritten note, which I still have, thanking me for doing that. And I can remember him always being willing to give the time to a young person always um, being just, I, I want to talk about, I guess, memories of him and what a kind, gracious gentleman he was. As time went on, and I, I had passing acquaintance with him through politics, then I went on to law school after college, and I had worked in uh, Washington, D.C. one summer, Cong Congressman Robert Mullahan had hired me in, in the Congress for one summer. And I'd also worked for the JAG Corps one summer, so I was intrigued with Washington. I wanted to go up there and work. So two other of my classmates and I, in our the last semester of our senior year in law school, went up to Washington, and we tried to knock on the doors of various people. I went to see the various congressmen, and I don't remember Congressman Rahal, 
you were probably one of them, but went over to see Senator Randolph, and he was in a committee meeting, and his then secretary was, it was a very strong gendarme, as a good secretary is, and protective of the senator, and she explained to me he was in a committee meeting, and he, he couldn't greet me, but she would tell him that I came, but I persisted, and um, I kept saying, I really want to meet the senator and say hello to him, so she got him on the telephone, he was over in a committee meeting, and he greeted me, and then he said, you know, my dear, have someone bring you right over here so you can watch the committee in action. So I went over, watched the committee, and then he was so gracious. Here I am just, you know, a kid from West Virginia. He went and sat in the gallery with me, and we watched the Senate in action. And I was, of course, in awe of all this. And um, he looked over and he said, you should consider working up here when you get out of law school. Well, I thought, bingo, this is what I came up here to get. Sure enough, Senator Randolph, I mailed in my resume. He did hire me as an assistant counsel to the majority of his public works committee where I had a very good experience um, working on the Hill. And as, as I observed Senator Randolph over the years, um, he's everything that everybody's said here today. I've worked in with and for politicians and public people at all levels, everything from sheriff campaigns to working in a presidential campaign. And I don't think I've ever worked with or served anyone who was more genuine than Senator Randolph. He um, was an inveterate campaigner, but there was nobody that could outwork him in the work that he did. He loved people and he loved serving people. He loved public service, I truly believe that. One of my last uh, experiences with the senator was that in his last campaign, Senator Ted Kennedy was coming into West Virginia to campaign for him. And they asked me and my friend Marie Prezioso, who was also loves the senator, she couldn't be here today, they asked us to go up and plan the trip for him and Senator Kennedy to campaign. And they did, every, they did a whistle stop little tour all through the smaller communities and they'd stop and greet people, get back in the vehicles and go. And I remember one stop we had. Well, first of all, Senator Kennedy couldn't get Senator Randolph to come on. He was, Kennedy was waiting on the elevator and he said, somebody get Jennings. And he was in there um, fixing his hair up and eating something and finally got him on the road, got him out of there and he went into a um, one of the coal Mines, we had, they had a little greeting for him, and they had a big old box of donuts. He did like to eat. And he was sticking some of those donuts in his pocket. And as soon as he came out of there and we got in the car, he looked at me and Marie and he said, girls, where are we going to have lunch? <laughs> so um, he had a zest for life in every way. And uh, we so much enjoyed that. And as I said, we were doing whistle stops. There was no intention to give speeches. And there was such a crowd in that little community of Monongah, they got out of the cars. And Senator Randolph looked at Marie and said, Marie, where's my podium? Where will I, where will I speak from? And of course, there was no podium. But we found the second floor of one of those two porch, two-story houses, and he got up on that. Um, and I remember one other time when I was in college, uh, I was at a big Democratic dinner in Morgantown, and President Johnson had come in. And just that day, or the day before, his daughter had given birth to his first grandchild. And I had a big sign that said, welcome, granddad. And Senator Randolph took that sign and went over and got Lyndon Johnson to sign it. So, and I still have that somewhere, I've got to find it. But I guess just to wrap it up, I would say that my experiences with Senator Jennings Randolph were, they were, for me, as someone who is in public office and public life, he was always an inspiration to me. And I've worked for, on the staff of a governor and a senator and a presidential campaign and now, of course, run for public office myself. But of all the people that I've ever encountered, I've seen no one who would outshine him in energy, in character, in kindness, and in real genuine love of public service. So it is great to be here to honor him today. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Justice Workman. Next up, we have a letter from Senator Rudy Boschwitz that reads, Jennings Randolph was one of the nicest and happiest senators I served with. He always had a smile. He was always willing to listen. 
He and his colleague, Robert C. Byrd, who I always addressed as Mr. Leader, worked hard at making the Senate, I'm sorry, worked hard at making the Senate work in a bipartisan manner. They always worked hard at moving much of the federal government to West Virginia and were quite successful at doing so. <laughs> they were quiet the team. Bird most serious and Jennings the jolly one pushing things along. Jennings just loved the Senate and loved the people and his West Virginia constituents. His office was covered with their pictures from floor to ceiling. He had many, many friends. I was privileged to be among them. Thank you. Now representing U.S. Senator, sorry. Now representing U.S. Senator Joe Manchin is Ms. Kim Good. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kim Good. I am here on behalf of Senator Manchin, and I've been blessed to have worked for four U.S. Senators representing West Virginia. Unfortunately, I missed working with Senator Randolph, maybe by a few years. <laughs> Um, Senator Manchin could not be here today. He's in Washington. Um, however, he did send some remarks video, uh, via video greeting. So I will be happy to turn that back over to Joe and let the Senator speak his words. Thank you. Hello, I'm Senator Joe Manchin. Particularly today on West Virginia Day, it is my privilege to welcome you to the opening of the Senator Jennings Randolph Collection by the West Virginia Department of Arts, Cultural, and History State Archives. There is a reason we present the Jennings Randolph Award each year to high schools in our home state. It is our responsibility in positions of leadership to empower the next generation with an understanding of the importance of service, collaboration, cooperation, and compassion, and to teach them that being civically engaged is an opportunity to be the change you want to see in your community, the state, and the world. That is what Senator Randolph stood for. As you take the time to appreciate this special collection of archives, I invite you to consider how Senator Randolph's contributions have had an impact on where we are today. For three decades, beginning in 1942, when he was in the House of Representatives, then Congressman Randolph pushed for an amendment to lower the voting age from 21 down to 18. He pursued his cause at every opportunity, and on his 11th attempt in Congress, they approved it. The measure became the 26th Amendment on June 30, 1971, attaining the approval of three quarters of the states. He worked to do this because he believed if you're old enough to fight for your country, you're old enough to vote for the people responsible for sending you into battle. He is an inspiration for all to learn about the inner workings of their government to speak up about important issues, and to give back to the community that helped shape who you are. I truly appreciate my dear friend and curator of arts, culture, and history, Randall Reed Smith, the longtime director of archives, Joe Geiger, and all who had a hand in making today's celebration possible. Thank you, and God bless each and every one of you. Next, representing U.S. Senator Shelley Moore Capito is Mary Elizabeth Eckerson. Thank you, Joe. It's an honor to be here on West Virginia Day, and it's an honor to learn so much about your father. I'm sorry I came along a little too late to know him very well. On behalf of Senator Capito, I, I offer the following greeting. Thank you for inviting me to join you today to celebrate the opening of the Senator Jennings Randolph Collection. I regret that my Senate schedule prevents me from joining you in person to honor our former United States Senator. Senator Randolph was a dedicated civil servant and devoted to the issues affecting West Virginia. Although I did not know him well, he was a contemporary of my father. My father challenged him in the U.S. Senate for the U.S. Senate seat in 1978 and was defeated. But both men maintained a good working relationship afterward as they did in that era. Although Senator Randolph and I are of a different time, we have a few things in common. 
We both served in the House of Representatives before we advanced to the U.S. Senate. He served, and I currently serve, on the Energy and Public Works Committee. Both of us work to promote the natural resources of our state and their ability to fuel this country. I am honored to follow in his esteemed footsteps. It is so fitting that Senator Randolph's archival collection be updated to, on, to an online platform. His educational background was in communications, so I think he would appreciate the accessibility to his records through this new venue. He had so many accomplishments during his years of service, and his records being online will make them available and easily found for anyone seeking information. I visited the site and was reminded that he was a key figure securing the passage of the 26th Amendment to lower the voting age from 21 to 18 so that men who were old enough to defend our country could vote. He worked to develop the interstate highway system and secured funds for the West Virginia Turnpike. He must have traveled West Virginia's roads quite a bit because he spent a lot of time addressing potholes and road issues in his releases. He helped create the Appalachian Regional Commission, which is a vital partner for economic development efforts in West Virginia to this day. He worked to improve mine, mine health and safety and black lung benefits, two issues that we continue to fight for. He also supported important legislation to help persons with disabilities work, as well as being a champion for education. I found some other interesting items in his press releases, but there is one that ties in directly to his collection. In 1983, I found a press release addressing TV in the Senate. I had to wonder what he would think of our delivery of information today from the Senate to the classroom. I think he would welcome the many different ways information is delivered and happy to know that his information is accessible online and available to mul through multiple electronic devices to all the public. I would like to commend the West Virginia State Archives for assembling and updating his historic collection, which provides us a glimpse into the life and work of U.S. Senator Jennings Randolph. To Senator Randolph's son, Frank, and his grandson Brian and the rest of the Randolph family, I hope you find this a fitting tribute and a revered acknowledgement of your father and grandfather's public service and his many accomplishments benefiting our state and the nation that will be treasured forever. It is an honor to serve you in the United States Senate. Sincerely, Shelley Moore Capito. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sekerson. Next, we have West Virginia's longest serving member of the House of Representatives, former Congressman Nick Rahal. Thank you very much, Joe. Son Frank, grandson Brian, friends of Jennings Randolph all. It's quite fitting, as has already been referenced, that we dedicate these archives today on West Virginia's birthday. During my 38 years in the House of Representatives and close to seven years prior to that as a staff member working in the Democratic cloakroom off the floor of the United States Senate, I got to be with Senator Randolph quite a few times and got to witness personally the landmark legislation that has already been referenced that he passed on behalf of not only West Virginia but our nation. But one thing stands out particularly to me and I was not in office at the time, but was in during the Nixon years and many presidents after him, whenever they would propose in their budget to eliminate the ARC, the Appalachian Regional Commission, Jennings Randolph would always give that little smile of his, actually big smile, and say, presidents can propose all they want, but Congress disposes. And he single-handedly kept the ARC alive each and every time a president would propose to eliminate it. And to this day, West Virginia still benefits from the Appalachian Regional Commission. And there's other legislation that's already been referenced, disability legislation, lowering the voting age, the U.S. Institute for Peace that still exists in Washington, D.C., that works in a very quiet way to bring opposing governments, not governments, I should say, thank goodness not governments, but opposing countries together. The people of those countries where so much progress can be made when you get the governments out of the way uh, and work in a quiet way to try to bridge some of the differences across this world, still promoting peace to this day. But during uh, the time that I've been, and I've had a lot of it lately, to go back over my archives 
and uh, see the hundreds and hundreds of pictures over my career, every day one pops up with Senator Randolph. And a lot of them are autographed. He had a habit of wanting to personally autograph photographs, as many of you in this room know. And uh, he would send it over to me. But the one that I think most appropriate on this day, West Virginia's birthday, that kept consistently showing up in my archives was every year on June 20th, our delegation would get together, as many of us as could. But Jennings Randolph always could. He was always there for the West Virginia Society celebration, cutting the birthday cake, celebrating West Virginia's birthday. And for the, most of those photographs, all, well, let's see, it started out five of us in the delegation at that time. <laughs> Not quite that many today. But nevertheless, uh, that was a proud day for Jennings Randolph to celebrate West Virginia's birthday. And I can recall my first year in Congress, 1976. We had a very close leadership race in the House of Representatives. Tip O'Neill was the incoming speaker by acclamation, no question. But the number two leader in the House was a big question mark. Four gentlemen were running. It took four ballots before it came down to two individuals, Jim Wright from Texas, considered the moderate, and Phil Burton, the liberal from California, to be second in command under Tip O'Neill. On the last ballot, the fourth ballot, Jim Wright from Texas won by one vote in our uh, Democratic caucus. Jennings Randolph called me in a Democratic cloakroom right after that vote. He said, Nick, I hope you voted right on that vote. I said, Senator, I voted right. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and uh, another thing, you know, I have the distinct honor as Joe mentioned, of being the longest serving West Virginia representative in the Congress of the United States. And I say that with emphasis because that's what Jennings Randolph was a real stickler about, calling us in the House of Representatives, not congressmen, but representatives, because that's what our founding fathers titled us as, and that's what we're to be addressed as, not congressmen, because senators and representatives both are congressmen, but he wanted us to be distinguished in the, well, distinguished in my mind anyway. I don't know whether in the senator's mind it was, but the, <laughs> to be labeled as representatives. During my years in the Congress, especially the early years, and even before I was elected, serving in the Democratic cloakroom, oftentimes I'd get a phone call from Jennings Randolph around two or three in the afternoon. Nick, I got to fly over to Jackson County tonight. Next night it might be Randolph County. Next night it might be I don't know where in West Virginia. At that time I hadn't heard of all 55 counties, to be quite honest. But I did because Jennings Randolph would call and want me to fly over with him for some campaign event. Like I said, this would be 2 or 3 in the afternoon. He'd say, wheels up out of National at 4 p.m. Can you be there? Yes, Senator, I'll be there. Uh, and so I would run to the airport, fly on a plane with him, oftentimes single-engine plane, very dangerous flights. But we'd come over to West Virginia, he'd have a campaign appearance, I'd be there carrying his bag or taking notes or whatever uh, in the background form. We'd get on a plane back to D.C., arriving midnight or so that night. Many a time we did that. And it was quite an experience. And one thing Jennings Randolph would always say, Nick, you've got to learn in political life. There's two things you never pass up. I said, yes, sir, what's that? He said, and these days there were no cell phones. He said, the first thing is a phone booth. And the second thing is a toilet. <laughs> and sure enough, every phone booth we'd pass in an airport or even on the roadway, sometimes driving to the event, if he'd pass a phone booth, we'd have to stop because there was somebody he had to call, family members to stay in contact, political supporters, constantly stopping at pay phone booths to make phone calls. And I, of course, was responsible for having the change ready to put in that phone booth. <laughs> and of course, the uh, second one about never passing up a toilet, that's still pretty good advice to this day. Uh, but 1984, I remember that campaign. You may recall then Vice President Walter Mondale was our Democratic nominee for President of the United States. In Huntington, West Virginia, Mondale was making a quick fly-by stop at the airport there. Jennings Randolph was introducing him. And Senator Randolph had a way about words. Sometimes he went on 
and on and on <laughs> and on. And th this happened at a partic this particular event with our nominee, Walter Mondale, at the Huntington Airport. And I'm sitting next to him, and I can see uh, Senator Mondale keep looking at his watch, and, and he'd say, you know, Nick, it's about time for me to get up and speak, but it happens to be time at my next event in the next state. <laughs> <laughs> and Senator Randolph is still introducing him here in Huntington, West Virginia. <laughs> and then there was the many meetings with Senator Randolph, uh, especially down toward the end of his career. Some would think he was not paying attention in some of the meetings in his office. And I would sit there with many a group, constituent groups, uh, with the senator. And uh, perhaps uh, he would not offer something like that. And, and those in the room would think he wasn't listening or wasn't engaged in the conversation and would keep talking on and on himself. Finally, Senator Randolph would speak up, stand up actually, and ask a question that just showed everybody in the room how he was on top of the issue, had listened to every word they said, and they were just taken back by the question that showed the senator's insight and knowledge of the issue with which they came to speak with him. And it was during the, many of those meetings that I got to know Bertie Cowell of his staff, a native West Virginian who was Senator Randolph's top aide on the Education Committee. And uh, after Senator Randolph left the Senate, Bertie Kyle came to work with me, and she was one of my top staffers until she passed away uh, right before 9-11 in the year 21, and she was uh, a 20-01, uh, and she was uh, quite an addition to my staff and continued providing help to our colleges and universities and our young people in West Virginia. So I conclude by saying, having known Jennings Randolph and having worked with him for the number of decades that I did is truly the second highest honor in my life. The first being representing the great people of West Virginia for 38 years in the House of Representatives. I thank God that I had both of these opportunities in life. Thank you. Now representing the West Virginia Secretary of State, Mac Warner, is Mr. Mike Queen. Mike. Thanks, Joe. Thank you very much for being here, uh, Mr. Speaker. Representative Ray Hall, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I am honored to be here on behalf of Secretary Warner to talk about Harrison County's United States Senator Jennings Randolph. It wasn't uh, long after um, Secretary Warner went to Washington, D.C. on Monday on a little bit of a trade mission uh, for the governor that he called and said, I don't know that I'm going to get back in time. Would you mind speaking for me on, on behalf of the Secretary of State's office? And uh, I thought he was kidding. You know, being from Harrison County, I wouldn't mind at all. Jennings Randolph was a, a figure larger than life in Harrison County. He inspired... Uh, scores and scores of, of elected officials in Harrison County to run for public office. Uh, my son, who's a fourth generation to serve um, in the legislature and be a public servant here in Harrison County, knows, uh, here in the legislature, knows about Jennings Randolph from Harrison County. Shortly after uh, Senator, or I'm sorry, Secretary Warner took office last uh, last January, uh, we got a phone call from, from this group called Inspire, and they wanted to, the uh, secretary to be part of uh, their program to register high school students. And uh, we didn't know a lot about Inspire, this statewide effort to, to register high school students, and it wasn't long that Secretary Warner, uh, true to his, uh, his support for young people and engaging young people, uh, learned that uh, there was a West Virginia award given to high schools called the Jennings Randolph Award, which was a legislative initiative uh, approved by the legislature, but requested by then Secretary of State Ken Heckler, uh, who served with Jennings Randolph in Congress. We learned that uh, not only was Jennings Randolph the, uh, the father of the 26th Amendment, but there is an entire story behind Jennings Randolph's effort to get that 
uh, 26th Amendment passed. You know, uh, rarely did he uh, object to or disagree with President Roosevelt after he took, uh, uh, took office as a young congressman. But he certainly did when um, President Roosevelt at the time, in need of more soldiers for World War II, reduced the, the draft age from 21 to 18. It was a, it was a big deal. It was a big deal. Uh, soldiers were, at that time, were eligible to serve in the, in the Army at 17, but, but couldn't be drafted until they were 21. So when the President, and on, ironically, on November the 11th, 1942, November the 11th being a key date, right, uh, issued the Presidential Proclamation, Senator, Congressman, Representative uh, Randolph at the time, went to work trying to get the legislature uh, the, in Congress not to pass, not to approve it. But it was certainly approved, and the draft was reduced from 21 to 18. In January of 43 is when, formally, Congressman Randolph introduced for the very first time the 26th Amendment. And it was he who made that phrase popular, as Senator Manchin said, if these young men are old enough to fight, they're old enough to elect those elected officials who are making the decisions as to whether or not they could be drafted. Obviously, the, 40, the 26th Amendment didn't pass in 1943. It didn't pass in 1953. It didn't pass in 1963. It wasn't until the height of the Vietnam War, that Jennings Randolph, then United States Senator from Harrison County Randolph, was able to get enough public support in Congress to get the 26th Amendment passed. The irony of all that is that he never gave up on young people. He was inspired by his peers to engage young people and keep young people engaged. And the speaker, you're going to hear from Rod Rogers here in a couple of minutes. He's going to tell you a little bit about the relationship with John W. Davis and, uh, and Jennings Randolph. But after the 26th Amendment was passed, and with a stroke of a pen by President Nixon at the time, 14 million Americans became eligible to vote between 18 and 21. By the time all the paperwork got set up and everything was ready, it was Jennings Randolph who got the call, uh, who was able to identify the first American of 18 years old to register to vote. And had it not been for my relationship with Secretary Warner and Secretary Warner's uh, just deep interest in engaging young people and, and, and making this, this award mean something again, the Jennings Randolph Award, I wouldn't have known that, that your dad and your granddad walked into Davis and Elkins College. And there was a young lady sitting at the front desk and she said, he said, young lady, how would you like to be the first 18-year-old in America to register to vote? LMA Thompson, who's now LMA Thompson Haddix, recalls, she said, I really didn't know who he was when he walked in. He introduced himself. And she said, not only was I honored to be asked by Senator Randolph to go register to vote with him to be the first 18-year-old. She said he escorted me to the Randolph County Courthouse to register to vote. What Jennings Randolph didn't know was that LMA Thompson's brother, Joseph, was killed in Vietnam, drafted at 18, and died two weeks before he was supposed to return to West Virginia, killed in battle. So she went to register to vote, not only for herself, and not only because Senator Randolph had asked her to, but she registered for her brother. And she tells the story, she was, she was getting ready to register, and she knew that Senator Randolph was a Democrat, but that her family were Republicans. She said, it went through my mind. She said, just for a minute, maybe I should register as a Democrat, because he was, he was so nice to ask me. She said, but I just couldn't do it. <laughs> she said, I registered as a Republican, and she said, Senator, I'm sorry. He said, no, no, no. Don't you ever be sorry. Being registered to vote is the most important thing that I could ever ask of anybody. And, and that, you know, I, I'm going to fight for your vote. I'm going to try to earn your vote. 
But if you want to be registered as a Republican, the most important thing is that you're registered. She never forgot that story. We reunited last year with Ella Mae Thompson Haddix, who uh, became an art and history teacher, retired two years ago at Tays Valley, I'm sorry, at Tigers Valley High School, uh, where she spent her entire teaching career. And she went with us to Girl State last week uh, when Secretary Warren went to speak, and she told that story. And she says, every time I go to vote, I remember my brother, and I remember Jennings Randolph. And I think that's a pretty cool story, uh, that, that this particular gentleman, who she didn't know when he walked in that front door at Davis and Elkins College on that cold day in November to ask her to be the first person to register to vote. And she thought for just a moment, maybe he was a crackpot. She really wasn't sure. But she, she followed Jennings Randolph. She said, I, I voted for Jennings Randolph. She said, but I did so as a Republican. We have had, a, a, it's been an honor for us in the Secretary of State's office to renew the interest in the Jennings Randolph Award that the legislature established and that, that uh, Ken Heckler as Secretary uh, started 24 years ago. Next year is the 25th year. And you have to understand that the Jennings Randolph Award is given to those high schools who register 100 percent of their eligible students to vote. Now that's a pretty tough task. 100 percent. other, And it's a student-led effort. It's, it, we don't bring politicians in. We don't, it, it, it is a student-led effort. Uh, there's always been 10, 12, 13, 14 schools to be, uh, to be Jennings Randolph schools each year. And, it, and it, it, it requires a personal visit by the Secretary of State. And we have an Honorary Secretary of State program now that the legislature uh, recognizes those student leaders who help. Uh, this year I'm proud to say that there were 37 Jennings Randolph schools in, in West Virginia. Thanks to the help of groups like Inspire and the political parties and civics teachers all over the state, uh, our field team who works their tail off trying to engage uh, people so that we, once you get them started, it seems like the schools will do it every year, right? Uh, but as of yesterday, we've registered 20,000 136 high school seniors to register to vote in the 16 months that Secretary Warner's been in office. And every one of those know the name Jennings Randolph. Thank you for allowing me to be here. This letter was sent by Senator Nancy Cassabon Baker of Kansas. I am honored to address a few thoughts at the opening of the Senator Jennings Randolph Collection. In serving 18 years in the Senate from 1978 to 1996, I'm certain there were many times of votes and debates with Senator Randolph. However, my favorite memory is a conversation that my father, Alf Landon, the 1936 Republican presidential nominee, had in our home in Topeka, Kansas with Senator Randolph. It must have been 1984 or 1983 when the senator was in Topeka for a speech. They talked a bit about politics, but the enthusiasm came when they realized they had probably played on opposing football teams in high school. My father lived in Marietta, Ohio, just across the river. Both were in their 90s now, but the delight in these memories of that time and place was a joy to hear. A treasured visit. Senator Nancy Cassabon Baker. Next representing Congressman David McKinley is Mr. Rod Rogers. It's great to be here today. Um, Frank, Brian, a big, big fan of the senators. I can tell you as a young man, I met the senator and at a W football game in the press box. Uh, the senator had a large plate of chicken wings in front of him, which he loved. We developed a great friendship. We sat there during each game and we talked about sports and we talked about politics. I'm a big history fan, uh, specializing in, in West Virginia history and politics. About that same time, I became fascinated with John W. Davis, West Virginia's only presidential candidate from a major political party. During the research on John W. Davis and the campaign of 24, 
I realized that Jennings Randolph, uh, again from Harrison County, graduated from Salem College, shortly after graduation, took a job with the Exponent Telegram. With the Exponent Telegram, one of his first major stories was to cover the acceptance speech given by John W. Davis. This is very important because this was the first acceptance speech, first and foremost in West Virginia, and it's the first acceptance speech for a major Democratic um, party uh, for the nominee uh, ever to be broadcast nationwide on radio. 50,000 people came to Clarksburg that day, specifically the time and date, 8 o'clock in the evening, August 11th, 1924, Monday evening. Everybody was there, including Jennings Randolph, the young cub reporter, was at the front row. And as John W. Davis began speaking, he was introduced by Louis Johnson, Secretary of War, later become Secretary of War, also from Harrison County. Jennings took all the notes down. I have several pages from his original notepad uh, that he submitted in and, and typed up his report. I also have the original newspaper um, uh, with his byline. And his byline and his article was picked up nationwide. So I applaud you and I applaud your family. And I applaud the senator. Every home game where I would sit there, he would save a seat for me. Uh, this is from the early 80s. And we would sit and watch the game and talk about politics and talk about sports. Fantastic person. I also have, other than that, I have remarks from Representative uh, David B. McKinley uh, from the 1st Congressional District. Thank you for your invitation to participate in the public opening of the Sen Senator Jennings Randolph Collection here at the Cultural Center in Charleston, West Virginia. Unfortunately, my duties in Washington prevent me from joining you today. But please know that I send my best wishes to all who are in attendance, especially the Senator's family members. As one studies the political history of West Virginia, the political life and times of, what, of Jennings Randolph stand out as, exceptional, as an exceptional public servant. He's a leader and a statesman. Senator Randolph was an individual that truly made a difference in the life of all West Virginians, not just during his life, but for many years to follow. Senator Randolph understood the value of infrastructure. His untiring work and passion to provide reliable air service throughout West Virginia has been a valuable tool for economic development. The legislation that Senator Randolph championed is indicative of his character and intellect. The list includes the Equal Rights Amendment, the Randolph Shepard Act, the Aeronautics Legislation, Synthetic Liquid Fuels Act, the Department of Peace, and the 26th Amendment to the Constitution. It is my hope and desire that providing access to the, to the Jennings Randolph Collection for this generation and for future generations will provide the insight into our rich history and may allow future leaders to build upon Senator Jennings, what Senator Jennings Randolph has already established. Thank you. We are very pleased to have with us today Pat Griffith of Washington, who served as Senator Randolph's press assi assistant for many years. Pat? Thank you, Jim. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Pat Griffith from Harrison County. It sounds like that's a good place to be from, <laughs> according to this crowd. Um, I was always more behind the scenes, so I'm not that accustomed to being at the microphone. Uh, I may refer to my notes more so than others. But um, as a schoolgirl in Clarksburg, I volunteered at a sheltered workshop teaching those with special needs how to refinish furniture. And little did I know then that an old wooden chair would someday change my life. After college and grad school in DC, I worked initially at the United States Department of the Interior Bureau of Mines, and then I taught school for several years. 
1976, I became one of three finalists for the press assistant position in Jennings Randolph's office. And I was just told to be on call and wait for that third and final interview when he would make the decision. I was pretty nervous about that. But I got the call and I went up to his private office in the Capitol, and, which was a real hideaway uh, where only senior members had a second office. And he made me feel so at ease. Um, and toward the end of the interview, I noticed an old wooden chair near his desk and I inquired about it and he just beamed. He got so happy he immediately jumped up from his desk and got down on his knees on the floor and turned that chair upside down and said, come here, I want you to take a closer look at this chair. And so I did and he said, this chair belonged to my grandfather, Jesse Randolph. And Shortly thereafter, I got the phone call that he wanted me to be his press assistant. So I always think about that old wooden chair somehow bringing me good luck. Um, I, maybe this is the most important part. I was registered as a West Virginia Republican when he hired me. So I think that says something about him. I'm, I'm just going to pass that on. <laughs> In his office, our, st our staff affectionately called him J.R. And he approved with one caveat. He always emphasized, okay, I'm J.R., but I'm the good one. <laughs> J.R. was a genuine heart and soul man of and for the people always remembering the man and woman in the wayside of the road. A gentle giant, fiercely pragmatic and persuasive in his legislative endeavors. J.R. transcended party lines with his innate talent for working across the aisles in the theater of politics. He described each morning as a new day to do better, to make a difference. He always viewed problems as challenges and opportunities. He was a consummate coach, cheerleader, and his bipartisan legislative teams enjoyed many victories. Jennings Randolph was a gifted wordsmith, teaching me never use the words he disliked, such as nice or proud. He was so animated and masterful in his choice of motivational verbs and adjectives, always asking how he could be helpful to anyone seeking assistance. He had a knack for rallying people, even disagreeable ones, to cooperate and succeed in their collective strengths. Above all, he was a good listener. He hand-penned many notes, signing all his correspondence truly, Jennings Randolph. There are many stories I could share, but we'll save those for another day. I, I'm going to mention a few, just to whet your appetite. Um, and I imagine Frank and Brian have heard some of these, but his lunch along a West Virginia highway with Eleanor Roosevelt and then finding only pennies in his pocket when the check arrived. Um, his night ride down Cheat Mountain when the brakes gave out with O. Smith. Do you remember O. Smith? Morning carpool to the United States Capitol with me and a live possum in the trunk. I don't know if you ever heard that one. <laughs> There's a long... It's true. <laughs> And I'll tell you about it in the reception. Um, his discussions with Saudi princes, Nigerian chiefs, Chinese provincial leaders, even a King Ranch cattle baron who survived Fidel Castro's firing squad. We could go on and on forever. But, and this is kind of a personal touch to today's commentary. One day in 1978, during his campaign for re-election, 
The senator called me into his office and he asked me for an update on two lunch programs that we organized annually to encourage student interest in government. One was the National Youth Science Camp, which had the top two science students from each state uh, come to Washington to meet their senators. And the other was the National YMCA Youth Governors Program, where the um, one representative who was the YMCA youth governor from each state came. And the senator and I would work very closely on this together. He always organized a, an amazing head table of um, inspirational speakers to try and motivate young people in these leadership positions to you know, continue their interest in government. And I think one of those uh, spoke earlier today. Uh, I don't know if, he, is he still here? No, he left, okay. But uh, I remember him, because I was the one organizing all the press files and the photo files, and, and the Senate photographers used to always laugh when I would call them, because, okay, another student group on the Capitol steps, and off we'd go. And uh, I think he had more group photos taken than anyone, and uh, that's because he loved the, the youth and he just you know wanted to keep them motivated and when we'd be on those capital steps he'd always entertain questions from them anything they wanted to talk about anyway after I briefed him on the latest um, on the two youth luncheons we were organizing that July he said well is there anything else you want to share and he looked up at me and I thought, well, do I tell him this or not? I don't know. And, and he, I said, well, Senator, at a campaign party last night, I met a guy from the State Department who told me he was the grandson of the Jennings family of Randolph, Vermont. And the Senator kind of winced at first and then his eyes got really big. <laughs> And he opened his desk drawer and pulled out an 8 by 10 color photo and his big black pen and wrote, best wishes to the grandson of the Jennings of Randolph, from Jennings Randolph. He flung it at me and said, send that down to the State Department. And so little did I know then that eventually the two of them would be working together on an international program um, called the Agri Energy Roundtable. But one statement he said as I was leaving the office, he said, you know, Pat, you're meeting this person who's a grandson of the Jennings of Randolph, maybe as an omen. And I, you know, I never thought too much about it until five years later when Nick and I married. <laughs> and guess who out-toasted everyone at our rehearsal dinner? <laughs> including both our fathers. <laughs> and guess who was the first person uh, to arrive at our son's christening three years later? And we named him Nathaniel Randolph Hollis in memory of your dad, and also of Randolph Vermont, but more so because it was your dad who kind of brought us together in a working relationship that blossomed. When our son was christened, Senator Randolph was retired at that time, and he was 84 years old. He actually walked up Cathedral Avenue to Annunciation Catholic Church, and he was already sitting in the, f the first pew when we walked in with the baby, and I just burst into tears. I mean, he, he was just that kind of a person. Um, okay, before I start crying, um, Everybody knows that J.R. loved his family, and um, I'm glad that the magician is here today. <laughs> he always called Brian his magician. Uh, magician. Everybody knows he loved Salem and Elkins. I'm not sure everybody knows how much he loved horse racing. That's another story. Um, other people talked about his love of food. I know he especially enjoyed gingerbread and apple cider, and we made sure that was available when we had his Capitol Memorial Service. I actually baked the gingerbread myself to make sure it was there. Um, he shared postum 
instead of coffee with uh, his sister Ernestine at breakfast after Mary passed. And I didn't know what postum was, but I soon found out that it was a combination of wheat bran and molasses in a powdered form. Um, Jennings Randolph wrote several uh, poems, including a ballad about a mouse that I still enjoy reading at Christmas time. Do you, do you know that? The ballad? Okay. He loved to quote people in his speeches, and there are two quotes I'm going to share with you today, um, just because I think they really uh, represent his view on life and the people he loved. The first one is by Cardinal John Henry Newman. I sought to hear the voice of God and climb the topmost steeple, but God declared, go down again, I dwell among the people. And then another by Napoleon Hill. If you must speak ill of another, do not speak it. Write it in the sand at the water's edge. Many of you may know his favorite song was the West Virginia Hills. And he bellowed it so loudly the last time I visited him in St. Louis that the nurses came running down the hall to make sure he was okay. And I just smiled at them and I said, he's fine. He was just a little homesick. So where do we go from here? Um, the spirit of Jennings Randolph is with us here today. And I know he's really smiling at you, Joe, and at all of your staff who helped preserve the photos and volumes of his work. May this collection be a rallying point to study, learn, and master Jennings Randolph's lessons, skills sorely, sorely needed today in our lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pat. Next, representing Congressman Alex Mooney is Ms. Susie Azevedo. Good afternoon. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to be here. I have had in the last few hours a history lesson that I will never, ever, ever forget. And I am a history buff, so this has just been fabulous. The congressman was not able to make it today, and so y'all are stuck with me, but I do have some words that he would like me to read for you. Greetings, friends. Thank you for the invitation to celebrate West Virginia's 150th birth, 155th birthday and to honor the service of the late Senator Jennings Randolph. I am sorry that I cannot be with you today due to votes in the U.S. House of Representatives, but I send you my sincere wishes for successful celebration. A native son of the Mountain State, Senator Randolph served with honor and distinction for 14 years in the House and 26 years in the U.S. Senate. A successful legislator, he led the charge for more than 26 bills that became law. During his tenure, he voted for some of the most important pieces of legislation that helped to mold our country, such as the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act. His greatest accomplishment was, without a doubt, his tireless attempt to lower the voting age from 21 to 18 years of age. When his dream became the 26th Amendment to our Constitution, he said, I believe that our young people possess a great social conscience, are perplexed by the injustices which exist in the world, and are anxious to rectify these ills. It is an honor to serve in the same seat once held by Senator Randolph. And I thank everyone, including the Randolph family, for making this day possible to honor the service of a beloved West Virginian. I look forward to visiting this exhibit in the near future. And again, happy 155th birthday to all Mountaineers. Best wishes, Alex X. Mooney, Member of Congress. Representing Congressman Evan Jenkins is Mr. Michael Chirico. Michael? 
I too love that song, so wonderfully said. Uh, it is an honor to be here on behalf of Representative Jenkins, and uh, I can tell you the Congressman has great admiration for the public servants that have come before us and, and quite quintessentially paved the way in so many respects. So thank you very much uh, for having us here today. Um, I know growing up in Huntington, at Huntington High, we had a great history teacher called uh, Mr. Ferguson. And he really educated us on your father being a wonderful order and just really being able to speak to the values and to really be empathetic with West Virginians and kind of take them on a sentimental journey. So uh, I remember that growing up as I had never had a chance to meet him. So thank you very much. And I bring greetings on the Congressman's behalf. Uh, dear friends, I was honored to receive your invitation to participate in the opening of the Senator Jannings Randolph Collection in our beautiful state capitol. I regret that I am able to join you today due to votes in the U.S. House of Representatives, but I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the organizers of today's event. Senator Jennings Randolph was a native of West Virginia who dedicated his life to public service. During his time on the national stage, he worked diligently to develop the interstate highway system in our state, helped create the Appalachian Regional Commission, and aided those affected by black lung. Today, we celebrate the life and legacy of Senator Jennings Randolph. Thank you for all being a part of honoring and preserving this important figure in the history of our state. Frank and Brian, this collection will serve as a reminder for future generations of all the great things Senator Jennings Randolph did for our state. Sincerely, Evan H. Jenkins, Member of Congress, thank you very much. Thank you. This is a letter from Vice President Walter F. Mondale. And we wrote to, uh, at Joe Phillips' suggestion, we wrote to all the living U.S. Senators who served with Jennings Randolph, and I thought it quite fitting and certainly reflective of what we've heard today, that we got responses from two Democrats and two Republicans. So I thought that was perfect. Anyway, this is again from Vice President Walter F. Mondale. It is my distinct privilege and honor to join with you in remembering our wonderful friend in the Senate, Senator Jennings Randolph. He was a solid and sensible men member of the Senate. He was a unifier, and he tried to move the Senate forward, including on the issue of civil rights, which still plagues many of our citizens today. I loved serving with him. We shared a lot of laughs. I am glad you are honoring him. May I join my voice with yours? With best wishes, Walter F. Mondale. Finally, we are delighted that Frank Randolph could join us for this special occasion, and I've asked him to say a few words to close our event. Mr. Randolph. I'm overwhelmed with emotion. I've shed a few tears. And I probably will while I speak to you very shortly. I've learned a lot about my father's life, and I could go on for another hour about nothing that has been shared with you today, but I'm not going to do that. But truly, this is the greatest honor our family could have. It will stay with us forever. I want to thank Joe for all that he's done, and Joe Bogg. Thank you. We're on an ongoing interview. She's recording. She's visiting me in Washington. We've had our first session. And she said, many hours to come. And I said, yes. I'm going to tell you a few things that no one shared with you today. But I'm again, I'm not going to bore you with them. But Dad was always at my side. and always wanted to include me in everything he did. He'd draw me out of college classes to go to London overnight for a conference. Those were the days where a congressman or a senator was able to say to their son or their daughter or a close relative, come on this trip with us. Nobody was watching the way they do today. He introduced me to King's emperors all over the world I got to go with him because I was in Washington my brother Jay who was not he was married and on the road and living a life 
that was unbelievable and produced three wonderful children. And Brian's here with me today. It means so much. And for each and every one of you that are here today, Nick, what you said today meant so much. This is um, a day for me that will always be with me. I, I can't say more, but thank you all so much. Thank you. I'd like to once again uh, thank my staff for all their work on the, the Randolph collection, the processing of it. I encourage you to take advantage of all the things that we have online that we have to view. Uh, but certainly I wanted to thank, uh, express my gratitude to everyone for attending this event. It was a lengthy event, but uh, as Frank noted, I could, I could sit here for a couple more hours listening to stories. In closing, uh, we would just like to thank Jo Bogus Phillips for her assistance in planning this event. She came up with... And lastly, I'd, I'd certainly like to thank my boss, the curator of the Department of Arts, Culture, and History, Randall Reed Smith, for his support of our work. And he would like to invite you to join him in the Great Hall for a reception. So again, thank you very much for coming.